Wonderful. And we are now recording. So I'd like to welcome everyone today to our info to go session. Um, today's info to go is called Girls Who Code at Your Library. This event is brought to you by the Idaho Commission for Libraries with funding support through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We're going to record today's session so that the recording can be available for library customers who can't attend at this time. And so look for it on our website if you want to review it or want to share it with anyone you work with. My name is Tammy Hollyhouse. I work here at the Idaho Commission for Libraries and I'll be your host today. But I'm going to turn it over to um, our presenter, Valerie Tomitsi. Did I pronounce that correctly? Pretty Tomici? close, yeah, Valerie Tomitsi. <laughs> Great. And she will be um, doing the presentation with a little help from our friend here in Donnelly, Idaho, Sherry. Shyline. Ah, I probably didn't do that one right, did I? Sheline? Help me out, Sherry. Sheline? Yes. Yes, she that's correct. Sorry, I was okay, muted. Great. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so take it away, Valerie. Wonderful. And thank you for the introduction, okay. Tammy. Sure. Hi everyone. So uh, my name is Valerie Tomici. I am a community partnerships manager here at Girls Who Code. Um, essentially what that means is that I connect with libraries, school districts, community organizations to share a little more about our curriculum and how to bring uh, STEM initiatives, coding, computer science into your communities um, and really sharing the ways that anyone can do that um, and uh, kind of the flexibility of those programs. Um, so for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why Girls Who Code exists, so the movement for gender equity um, and how we um, kind of combat that. So through our Girls Who Code clubs. I'll also talk about the impact that we've had so far. And then I'm so excited um, to welcome Sherry to talk a little bit about how Girls Who Code has impacted her community and what the club's programs have looked like in Donnelly Public Library. Um, and with that, we'll be able to have a question and answer. Um, so as I'm talking, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, I know Tammy will be keeping an eye on them as they come in. Um, and then we'll also have a big Q&A at the end. So I'm really excited to get as specific as we need to be. Um, definitely think about the ways that Girls Who Code might be able to come into your community. And if there's any kinds of kind of question marks that pop up as you envision that, I'm really excited to tackle those today. So to jump right in um, with the movement for gender equity, um, here I have a few stats about um, what computer science is looking like right now. Uh, today alone, there are over half a million open computing jobs in the United States, and again, open computing jobs. Uh, so that's all opportunity. Uh, these jobs tend to have an average salary of about $100,000 a year. Um, and actually 91% of those jobs are located outside of the Silicon Valley. Uh, there can sometimes be this perception that most of the computing or tech jobs are in San Francisco, they're in New York, they're in the major cities, uh, but that's really not the case because these jobs can exist in almost any industry. Uh, and so 67% of these jobs are available in non-tech fields. So with all of this exciting buzz and opportunity, uh, we have found that this opportunity is not being accessed by everyone. So right now only 23% of tech employees are women uh, and that number is actually getting worse. So back in 1995 that was the number was 37%. So we're finding that as this opportunity grows and as more jobs pop up in these fields fewer and fewer women are getting to um, go into these fields. And so right now only 19% of students who receive a degree in computing are women and only 2% are women of color. So here at Girls Who Code, we're looking to turn this around uh, and we're starting with our youth. Um, to get a little specific, in Idaho alone, there are over a thousand computing jobs. Um, that was back in 2017. I believe that number has gone up a little bit in the past um, two years. Um, and there were only 435 uh, computer science graduates. So again, we're seeing that opportunity um, even at a state level um, and only 16% of those graduates were female. So in your individual states, we're really excited to 
um, expand and shine light on those opportunities as well. So that's where we come in. Uh, girls Who Code works to inspire, educate, and equip girls with computing skills needed to pursue 21st century opportunities. Uh, our real vision is to reach gender parity in computing and technology sectors. We serve all girls, um, and especially those that are underrepresented in computer science and technology fields in terms of race, creed, or background, uh, students who have little or no access or exposure to computer science education in school. So that could mean schools that don't have AP computer science or maybe don't have any kind of computer science classes or extracurriculars. Um, students that are on free and reduced lunch, um, and students that identify as female regardless of gender assignment at birth or legal recognition. So as you can see, our Girls Who Code clubs are really all about inclusivity. We want all of our students to feel like computer science is something that they can explore, that Girls Who Code clubs is a place where they can feel safe and um, willing to try new things, um, especially something that might be a little bit different, um, something that they haven't done before. And because of that, with our Girls Who Code programming, we actually welcome students of all genders to join. Um, and we've actually found that for a lot of young boys, getting involved in Girls Who Code can be a really great way to have exposure to female role models in tech. Uh, at Girls Who Code, we talk a lot about how you can't be what you can't see. And so that exposure to diversity in um, technology and the tech industry is so important for students of all genders. So let's dig into our Girls Who Code clubs a little bit more. Girls Who Code clubs are free after school programs for third through 12th grade girls uh, to join a sisterhood of supportive peers and role models and use computer science to change the world. Uh, we really like to emphasize that they are free. Girls Who Code is a nonprofit and so our goal is really to provide all of those resources um, and make it as easy as possible for educators to bring our programming into their libraries, schools, and community centers. We have various supports that um, come in with Girls Who Code. So we have our online curriculum platform. We have the curriculum itself and our books. Uh, we have ongoing support from our um, customer care team and our club success specialists. So these are people that are on the ground um, here to help facilitators as they move through the programming. Um, and then we also think about the ways that Girls Who Code can continue even beyond your club. Um, so we have our alumni programming and our alumni network. Um, we especially want girls who maybe get excited about Girls Who Code starting in their library to be able to find those opportunities and those jobs that I talked about earlier, even after they graduate high school and maybe once they're not doing Girls Who Code anymore. Uh, clubs can be led by facilitators. So a facilitator can be a teacher, a librarian, a parent, or any volunteer uh, from your community. No computer science experience is needed. And we really emphasize that because just like how we want all of our girls and young students to be excited about computer science and to really feel like this is something that they can try, we want um, our community members to feel the same too. And so if there's someone who's interested to bring girls who code into their community and maybe they haven't coded coded before or um, they don't have a background in computer science, we really want this to be a space where you can learn and get involved. Uh, we've actually found that a lot of our facilitators have learned to code alongside their participants in the program and it can be a really exciting way for the students in the program to see themselves as leaders and to understand that with something like coding, uh, this hands-on approach can be a really great way to learn and in a collaborative space where students are supporting one another, um, it's okay to kind of try and learn and you know maybe you don't get it the first time but you can try again. Um, so our educational philosophy has three pieces. We talk about more than code. So yes, we teach computer science, um, but we want our girls to walk away with more than just that. Uh, we have our sisterhood, um, that supportive environment, um, and then real world relevance and impact. Um, so we talk a lot about this in the sense that technology is everywhere. Um, and it's one thing to just learn a coding language or to understand um, what computer science is, but it's another to understand how it impacts um, really everything in life and that uh, even our girls in um, as young as our third grade programs uh, can create projects in computer science that impacts their community. 
Uh, so you can see here we divide out our programming in two groups. Um, we have our third through fifth grade clubs and then our sixth through twelfth grade clubs. Our programming is really designed to be flexible. So the number of sessions and the amount of time per session can really be stretched or shrunk uh, to fit the programming in place uh, in your library um, or community center. So you'll see on the left hand side, our third through fifth grade clubs are a little bit shorter. They typically run uh, for five or more sessions at about 45 minutes to 60 minutes per session. They start at the beginner level um, and they run on a book club model. Um, so we have both nonfiction and fiction books that dig in to computer science themes and we pair those with activities that teach our um, students and participants to start to learn how to code and how a computer really thinks. For our 6th through 12th grade clubs, um, the sessions are a little bit longer. Uh, you can see that we typically have um, just over 10 sessions and they're about an hour or two per session. Again, this is flexible depending on, on the amount of time uh, that's blocked off for typical clubs. Uh, skill levels for 6th through 12th graders can start at beginner and go all the way up to advanced. We have several different um, kind of programming modules that I'll go into a little bit more detail into in a bit. Um, and our curr curriculum features are the Girls Who Code project. Um, I'll talk about that quite a bit soon as well. Um, and really that project-based learning. There are over 120 hours of curricula, so our clubs can kind of be repeated over and over um, and can feel new each time, each semester. Um, and the plug and play model is designed to suit what goals and initiatives are already placed in your libraries. Um, so if there's already some programming in place that might be similar, uh, you can find ways to kind of pair our curriculum and funding opportunities with what you're looking um, to bring to your library. So going into a little bit more detail into our 6th through 12th grade club curriculum, uh, you can see in the sisterhood section, we're really focused on building community and building an alumni network and programming access. So again, allowing our girls and participants to see beyond um, just that one club and understand the larger reach that you can have when you're collaborating, when you're supporting one another in this work. Uh, more than code, so yes, so we teach um, kind of specific coding concepts, loops, variables, conditionals, functions, uh, but we also talk about 21st century skills. Uh, so what is the relevance of coding in the real world? Uh, becoming comfortable with public speaking, project management, bravery, resilience, innovation, creativity. These are all skills that you need, yes, to code, but also just in the world in general. And we really teach our participants uh, to be brave leaders and to really um, question things, be um, proud of the work that they've done, raise their hand in the classroom, uh, and really put themselves out there in that way. Um, and then finally, impact. Um, so really taking that passion and then the skills that they learn and turning that into a project um, so that all of this can come together to create something that they're really proud of that they can share with their community. Along the bottom here, you can see some of the coding programs that we use, um, Scratch, Python, uh, JavaScript, Funkable, Swift. Uh, again, for all of these coding languages, we provide all of the curriculum and uh, tutorials to go along with those. So you do not need to be familiar with these languages before doing Girls Who Code. We provide everything you need. Here you can see what a typical sixth through 12th grade a club lesson plan would look like. Uh, you can see that most of our sessions start with a sisterhood activity. This is a fun type of icebreaker that gets everyone talking, gets everyone collaborating, and really sets the mood for that supportive space. Uh, we then move into our women in tech spotlights. These are five minute mini lesson plans that uh, spotlight a woman currently or um, in history in technology. Uh, so this could be someone who is working for um, a company or someone who has been influential in technology. And it's a great way for our youth to see the different ways that you can get involved in technology and make an impact. 
uh, then the bulk of the lesson will be moving through the self-guided tutorials and Girls Who Code projects. Uh, you can see on the bottom hand, um, on the left hand side, there are uh, different samples of club plans. Uh, this is a screenshot directly off of our uh, website where you'll see that you can click on different options depending on what you're looking to bring to your curriculum and then you'll move through those modules based on which one you choose. And then every lesson ends with a Girls Who Code stand up. This is a chance for um, all of the girls to get together, share out what worked, maybe what didn't work, what they're excited to work on next time, um, and also really create a growth mindset uh, where they can give themselves feedback and really reflect on what they've learned and what they're going to take with them beyond this meeting. Uh, on the bottom right hand side, you can see what a standard club plan might look like. You can see that there are uh, different agendas for each meeting and in those agendas you can just directly click on the activities. Uh, so again, we know that time and capacity are often stretched a little thin and we really want anyone who's le leading a club to not have to worry about creating their own agendas, to not have to worry about compiling all of the different modules, uh, just to know that it's all right there and all you have to do is click on them to move through them. Uh, here's my favorite piece, the Girls Who Code projects. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that the 6th through 12th grade clubs culminate in the Girls Who Code project. Um, we really have a project-based uh, way of learning um, in our Girls Who Code clubs. Uh, so for every Girls Who Code club, the group will come together to choose a project about something that they care about in their community. You can see on the right-hand side, there are some samples of um, projects that previous girls have done. Uh, you can can see that there are websites um, about um, saving endangered animals, there are apps about ending hunger, uh, there's a game about um, kind of the journey that a sea turtle might take uh, if the water is polluted. Um, there's a lot of really exciting um, examples on our project gallery as well. So if you're interested in seeing some of the other uh, projects that our girls get involved in, um, you can definitely click through. Uh, but this is a really exciting way that um, girls can look around their community and see how they can make a change and then actually create that project um, to do that within the span of a semester or a year, depending on how long your club is running. Our third through fifth grade curriculum um, similarly focuses on themes of bravery and resilience and tying those together with computer science. Uh, but our clubs run a little bit more on a book club uh, style. So we know that often for third through fifth grade clubs, um, especially access to computers and laptops or internet can sometimes be a little tricky. So we wanted to make sure that there was an option for the clubs to run online or offline. Our third through fifth grade clubs use our best-selling books, we have a fiction and nonfiction one, uh, to teach girls to be brave and resilient um, and see the impact that, that can have on the ways that they approach challenges. So they'll read a passage, discuss it, and then take that with them to coding activities. Uh, here we have another sample lesson plan. This one is for the third through fifth grade clubs. Um, and you can see that these clubs are typically a little bit shorter, um, but similarly move through a sisterhood activity, uh, reading and reflecting, taking on that challenge, and then ending with that girls who could stand up to take a moment to reflect and see how we can grow for next time. All of our resources are available on our platform HQ. So HQ is our website um, and it's where we house all of our curriculum um, and all of the resources. Um, so not only are all of the activities um, and uh, reading sessions um, and links to all the lesson plans, but we also have our facilitator toolkits. So here we have webinars and ways that you can prepare um, if you feel like you need a little extra support in getting started. Um, so we have a checklist to help you plan your club um, and guidance for how to run your meetings. I mentioned earlier that we also have our club success specialists. These are staff members with Girls Who Code who are here to answer any questions that might come up about the curriculum. Um, so please know that even once you've gone through the webinars, if you have any questions at all, we still are here to help. 
So let's talk about what you need to get started. Uh, first, you just need some space. Uh, do you need uh, technology or book passages, depending on if you're doing the elementary or middle and high school um, modules? Um, and then finally, you just need someone to run the club and someone to be the decision maker. The facilitator and decision maker can be the same person, but essentially what we're asking is that there's someone who is affiliated with the library um, or nonprofit that can just help with the space and ensure that the club has everything that they need. Girls Who Code provides everything else. Um, so everything that you see here, we bring for you um, and support you as you move through these pieces. Um, so you can see, like we talked about, we have our clubs planned, uh, but we also have student recruitment resources. So let's say you know you're ready to go, you're excited to get started, but you're not sure if the students will join. Uh, we have flyers and all kinds of um, social media posts, email templates, uh, ways to get the word out to your community. We also have a clubs fund. So this is a mini grant of $300 that every club receives um, from Girls Who Code. So as a nonprofit, like I said, we're really here to ensure that there are no barriers um, in keeping you from getting your club started. So we provide that funding to be used for books, supplies, snacks, uh, robots, field trips, really whatever uh, you can think of that might get your students engaged and excited about computers. Science. We talked a little bit about the resources available on HQ, but those are all those computer science skills. So we make sure that you have everything you need to present that information. Uh, and then finally, we have that community. So we provide um, activities and icebreakers to help get your girls engaged and excited. Uh, and then we also are always really excited to pop in um, with virtual events um, when available and any kind of alumni programming. We're always really excited to hear from you too. So if there are ever any ideas about things that might be really exciting for your community, definitely share out. We have a very collaborative approach and flexible approach to the ways that Girls Who Code can be implemented. So we're always happy to hear from our facilitators. Um, here we have um, Bethany, who's one of our uh, favorite facilitators at Girls Who Code, who <laughs> shared out um, with us some of the ways that she got involved with Girls Who Code and just how she was feeling uh, through that process. Um, so she shared out a couple reasons why she was hesitant. Um, she actually was a parent um, who didn't have teaching experience. She didn't have computer science experience, and she was nervous if people would actually attend. Um, but she actually found that the uh, interest in the club grew very rapidly. They started out with just two members and they moved up to 25 uh, within just three weeks. Um, so that interest and kind of word of mouth spread really quickly. And she found that the curriculum that we provided, uh, the webinars and all of that, allowed her to focus on the girls and building relationships within the club rather than focusing on like studying computer science or prepping a meeting agenda. Uh, at Girls Who Code, we talk a lot about being brave and bravery. Um, and so she really took that to heart in starting this club and decided to just try it and bring it to her community. Uh, from there, she was able to find that coding is much more accessible than it seems, um, and the payoff of kind of the challenges that can come with coding is really worth it. Uh, with computer science and coding, we talk a lot about how sometimes you have to go back and redo pieces. There might be a bug in the code. You have to kind of start over sometimes, and to see that challenge as an exciting piece and that um, something that has a payoff and that just because something can be a little bit challenging, it doesn't mean that you're not meant to be doing it and that you're not good at it. Um, and that working together and collaborating can build a really strong um, community. So here at Girls Who Code, um, we've already served 185,000 girls across the country. Uh, last year, we had 6,500 clubs um, for the 2018 to 19 school year. Uh, we're already past that for the 2019 to 2020 school year. So it's really exciting uh, that it's only October and we already have over 6,500 clubs. Um, 
And a lot of those clubs were clubs that started up again that um, were members last year and decided to do it again this year. And so it's really, really exciting to welcome back uh, girls and facilitators uh, who have done it once before and want to learn more. 50% uh, of our students um, involved in Girls Who Code are from historically underrepresented groups. And we've actually found um, through our data uh, that our participants are majoring in computer science at 15 to 16 times the national rate. Um, so it's so exciting to see that for our girls who got started with Girls Who Code, that they're starting to see this as something that they could pursue in college and beyond. Um, so now let's talk a little bit specifically about the Idaho Commission for Libraries. Um, so at Girls Who Code, we love working with community organizations such as school districts, library networks, um, and other nonprofits to provide resources for our individual clubs. Um, so we're so thrilled to work with Idaho Commission for Libraries to bring computer science resources all across Idaho, especially to our libraries. Um, we also partner with the Boise Library, Idaho Out of School Network, Idaho STEM Action Center, um, and it's been so, so exciting to see that community reach through these networks. Um, if you're from a different state and you're curious uh, what organizations were partnered with in your state, definitely reach out to me after this webinar and I'm happy to connect you. Uh, but the really exciting thing about these community partners and community networks is that we can provide additional funding um, for these nonprofits. So actually every library that starts a Girls Who Code Club and is affiliated with the Idaho Commission for Libraries actually receives an additional $100 clubs fund. Uh, so the mini grant that I mentioned before, that $300 could actually become $400 to again use for snacks, books, t-shirts, robots, uh, really whatever it is that your uh, youth might be excited about. In addition, when you affiliate yourself with a community partner, such as the Idaho Commission for Libraries, we're able to support you um, in additional ways. Um, so for example, if um, Tammy and I are connecting and we see that actually a couple of clubs haven't claimed their clubs fund yet, we can check in and see maybe what's going on and help you to claim that funding um, and if there's any barriers there. We can also talk about doing events, um, even virtual events such as this webinar, to help get um, your communities excited. So let's talk about what next. <laughs> um, so getting started is actually pretty straightforward. We've really worked hard to make sure there are as few barriers as possible to actually get a club launch. Um, and to make sure that, you know, if you're feeling the momentum right now, that you're able to just jump in and do it and that you don't have to wait for the start of a new semester. You don't have to wait for a specific time in the year. We really want that flexibility to come through so that whenever your programming is uh, ready, that you're able to jump in and have access to our resources. So to create a Girls Who Code Club, uh, you start by just creating an account in HQ. Um, once you have an account, then you're already in our system and you're able to access um, like the project gallery and most importantly, the club's application. Our application to start a club is just 15 minutes long and it's really just looking to make sure um, that you have those three things that we mentioned earlier, uh, space to run the club, um, access to computers or our book passages, and someone who will run the club and be the facilitator. Once we're squared away and see that, we ha that you have all of those things, you'll get your approval email and you'll have all the resources to get started. So you'll have plenty of time, um, depending on what your timeline looks like, to review all of that information before you get started if you'd like. Uh, your CSS or your club success specialist will send you an email and check in, see if you need any help getting started. And from there, you're able to get started. Uh, one thing that I'll also want to call out is, of course, you'll want that extra funding. So you'll want to make sure that you just affiliate yourself with the Idaho Commission for Libraries uh, so you can have those additional benefits. On the club's application, there's just a question that asks, is your club affiliated with a Girls Who Code community partner? Um, and then you'll just be able to type in Idaho Commission for Libraries on the drop-down menu and you're good to go. 
Um, so now we get to get to the fun part. I know I've been blabbing on with a lot of uh, kind of specific information and we're all really excited to hear from Sherry and learn more about the John Lee Public Library and how they got involved with Girls Who Code. Um, so I'll take a pause for a moment um, so Sherry can come on and introduce herself. Hi everybody. Um, is my sound okay? Yep. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so in June, I went to something called Futures Camp, and um, Dr. Hemingway, who is um, from the Idaho STEM Action Center, and I'm going to post that link here too, so just in case some of you don't have it. Um, she spoke about the importance of STEM, and my excuse for our library of not doing STEM uh, was pretty simple. We just don't have space. We don't have space for a 3D printer. We don't have space for anything. So square footage wise, we're one of the smallest libraries in the state. Um, other than branch libraries, I think we are the smallest. Um, and so that was my excuse for not doing STEM. And it was a good excuse for me because I don't know anything about coding. I am completely stupid when it comes to computers. Uh, but we came to the school year and Donnelly does not have an after school program. Our um, neighboring communities, both Cascade and McCall, which are within um, 15 minutes both ways, both have uh, really uh, great after school programs at their um, prospective schools. And Donnelly does not. Um, Donnelly is also um, the highest uh, free and reduced school lunch rate in our valley. And so our school desperately needed something. So we just started looking for things to fill the void. And Dr. Hemingway really inspired me at Futures Camp to like get some STEM going, even when I didn't want to, like that, how important it is and the necessity of it. And so we started doing our research and I came across Girls Who Code and the thing that got me was the $300 could be used for snacks. <laughs> and it sounds so silly that that was a, like a selling feature, but most grants and um, the like uh, are not for, um, consumables. So you cannot buy snacks with most grants. And um, the after school hour, our kids are desperate for food. They're hungry. They come hungry. And um, so that was one of the big things that turned me on to Girls Who Code. And also the the fact that we didn't have to come up with a curriculum. So this is literally, I don't have to pay for prep time. Um, the facilitator opens the book. I mean, she is taking the book home and reading it and planning it out a little bit, but, but she can, she doesn't have to come up with anything creative. She literally just opens the book. It reads a chapter. We show a girls who code video and then the kids go. And then she just facilitates them on the computer. The kids have coded this week, a girl coded a mermaid and had her floating through the water, singing a song about Donnelly um, that she had sung into the computer. And I just sat there in awe because I see third graders doing something that I cannot do. Um, but yet we're teaching the class. Like we're teaching these kids to do something that we don't know how to do. So we're learning right along with them. Uh, it's super simple um, and it doesn't require any space. Uh, even though the one thing that she's saying is that you need space, the irony of that is the space that you need is so little. Um, so we only have three computers. Um, our library is uh, incredibly small. Uh, most likely everybody who's on here, their library is larger than ours. Uh, we have three computers and one laptop that the kids have access to, and then they have four tablets. Um, but most of the stuff uh, that they do is really fun coding exercises and it's teaching basics. Uh, last week they coded tacos. Um, so it was a, uh, we had the parents each brought uh, some taco ingredients and um, the kids coded tacos. So they had to write, it was um, it's underscore raining underscore tacos, uh, parentheses, hard shell, parentheses, parentheses, meat, parentheses. And if they forgot one of the ingredients, when they came out to the taco bar, the robot did it exactly as they had programmed it. And the kids, no matter how many times you had to explain the necessity of order and sequencing and 
uh, they just were not fully understanding it. But when they brought their taco uh, recipe to me, I literally made it as they had written it down. And so I slapped meat on a plate and then tomatoes. And the kid was like, no, 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 no. I, my shell, my shell. Your recipe does not have a shell. I want a shell. Then you have to write, rewrite your code. And the kids were like so excited about the simple exercise. And they did start understanding the necessity of having the taco shell before the meat. Um, and that was a girls who code exercise. We wouldn't have ever come up with that one on our own. It's super creative. Um, they have really great um, activities, uh, really great resources. Um, and the uh, financial component, they don't just send you a check. You actually turn in your receipts. Um, so it, which is not difficult. We just tried it this week. So we just did it our first time. Uh, and it was actually pretty relatively smooth. So, um, I can answer any questions that you guys have for us. Uh, we started with, uh, we have two coding clubs. We have girls who code, and then we have a coding club on Fridays, our coding club, the kids have to pay for. Um, and if they were not able to afford it, then the scholarships were available for the girl, for kids who are going to the girls who club, girls who code. Um, we do have boys in our girls who code, uh, and, um, our boys have no problem with coming to Girls Who Code. They actually talk about it at school all the time. They're like, I have Girls Who Code tonight. Uh, it's just that they just say it's the name of the program. Um, we're not equal boys and girls. We probably have, uh, I think we have 10 girls and three boys. So, and it's every uh, day after, every Thursday after school and it just lasts two hours. So, I don't Small town problems. Thanks yeah, so much. I'm just reading here. all the things here. Yeah, definitely. Everyone, please feel free to share any questions in the chat. Um, if you have any questions for me about specifics with Girls Who Code or for Sherry about how Girls Who Code can actually look like once it's in your community, uh, what it actually feels like to run a club, um, you can feel free to jump on um, the chat and question anything in. Um, and I also just want to pick your brain a little bit, Sherry, um, about um, some of the other activities that have like worked really well. Um, I love coding the taco. Um, what other activities have you done with your students? So um, we started with uh, teaching them about binary coding. Um, and so we did these little um, beads on this one are falling apart. So um, I don't know if you guys can see this. So this is uh, the alphabet in binary code. Um, it's a super simple activity. Um, it's literally, uh, this is duct tape, beads, string, and then a piece of wood. Um, the word binary was, uh, when we first asked the question, how many kids know what the word binary means? Not one of our kids knew what binary meant. Um, and so it was a really great way to teach the basics of coding without even touching a computer. Um, and that's going back to the basics was really helpful for our kids because um, it helped them understand that uh, in order to get to, uh, to go from point A to point B, there had to be a path and you had to learn all the little tiny components before you got there. And um, our kids are super excited to play with like Dot and Dash and our Kamigami robots and all these like little STEM things that we have, but we want them to know the inner workings. Um, last week they tore a computer apart. So we went out to the transfer station to the dump on free dump days and we got 10 CPU units. <laughs> And the kids literally tore them apart last Friday. So they had to identify like all the inner parts of the computer last week. And of course they had fun because to initially get into it, we had to drop it from the picnic table. So somebody had to stand on it and drop it. Um, but I, they started understanding the inside of the computer. Um, and now as we go, they, they won't get to the actual coding coding until towards the very end, but we do give them 20 minutes at the end of every day to get on uh, the computer. So we don't allow Roblox that are at our library. I know we, we censor Roblox, um, <laughs> but we do allow the kids so they're, uh, they can get on scratch, uh, PBS kids, 
uh, and free rice. And so when their parents aren't here, those are the only three websites we let them on. And um, so since the, we started Girls Who Code, the kids are coming in on their off time just to get on Scratch, um, which is really awesome uh, to see because they're coming in to the library on outside of club time to just get on Scratch. And they're wanting to do their name, they're wanting to do um, different um, uh, games. One of the girls is making her own video game on there. Uh, and we also, 4-H is doing a 3D printing class. And so we don't have a 3D printer, but they've been bringing theirs in. And uh, so we let the kids that are in Girls Who Code play with the 3D printer. And our book club is doing the benefits of being an octopus. And so the girls made me an octopus on the um, 3D printer. Uh, and those are the Girls Who Code kids, because those aren't, um, we don't allow any of the other kids to get on the um, 3D printer just yet. But so they're getting extra privileges. Uh, they're doing um, all of the books that they're reading um, are coding books. And our kids can tell you that um, if your school does AR, then the, the girls who code AR is worth four points. <laughs> so they've all tested on it. Um, they're allowed to read ahead, but we're just going chapter by chapter. So we're on week, we're on week four. So we've only been doing it for four weeks. Wonderful. Um, and I also was just curious, so um, you talked a bit about Scratch, which is one of the coding programs that we use. Had you ever used Scratch before Girls Who Code? Nope. I had never, I, I had not used Scratch at all. So um, in the, the first day we, I actually loaded the, the Scratch website was the very first day we did Girls Who Code. Um, Katie, who's my program um, coordinator, Katie looked at it two days before we started Girls Who Code. Um, we were, we kind of had gotten into a bind uh, with um, figuring out what we were going to do for the school year because our fiscal year doesn't start till October 1st mm -hmm. and we were out of money in September for an after school program. So we were kind of winging, winging it if you will, like we didn't know what we were going to do and then school started and it was there and then I left for a conference and then we needed to start as soon as I got back. And so neither of us had done anything to like thoroughly research it. And so two days before Katie had looked at it, the day that we did Girls Who Code, I opened Scratch um, for the first time with the kids and I knew nothing about it. And um, so we literally learned together. So there was no, um, I didn't do a training. I didn't go to any extensive training. I was just inspired in June and then we just did it. So it's super simple. It's so exciting to hear. And I, I think that that's always the piece that I love to hear about is, you know, you could have never done this before. And just like the girls are going to learn, just like your participants are going to learn, you can learn too. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, do we have any other questions for Sherry? Definitely don't be shy if you have anything um, or any questions for me. I did just want to add um, one exciting new feature for this year. Um, so like Sherry mentioned, um, we use a reimbursement model um, for our $300 fund. Um, but we did notice that last year, a lot of the clubs use that $300 on snacks. And we were thinking, you know, we don't want anyone to have to put upfront that money, um, even if we do reimburse it very quickly. Um, we're very proud of how quickly we reimburse. Um, so we did create an option this year um, where if you know you're going to use that funding for snacks, you can select that option and we'll send you a giant box of snacks uh, that will last you uh, the entire semester. Um, so really fun option there too um, that hopefully will uh, make it a little bit easier for uh, some libraries who maybe aren't able to Put up front that funding uh, right away. Uh, there is, of course, the option to reimburse if you're, you know, if you're a little bit more picky about what snacks you want, um, or if you want to be able to use some of the funding for snacks and some of it to buy a robot or other supplies. Um, but we're really excited that uh, we were able to update that a little bit this year. So I did want to say one thing that we do do um, is we listen to an inspirational video every single week when we start and we get those videos from the Girls Who Code website so or from the Girls Who Code YouTube page. And so um, uh, the kids sit and watch that like right when they walk in from school. So when they're hyper, that's kind of like our like 
pull together kind of time. And Girls Who Code does have these really great inspirational videos. So Lizzo, um, the R&B artist, uh, has a great song that they have on their um, YouTube. They have tons of really wonderful videos that have brought up conversations for our kids that are not coding related, but really inspirational related. We had a really wonderful discussion um, about what a hijab was. Uh, last week. Um, and uh, in rural America, um, I think that our kids um, sometimes don't get exposed to different cultures and uh, different norms. Um, and so I think that the, the rural um, America needs to kind of um, have that uh, exposure in a safe way for those kids to be able to ask questions. And that is a really awesome thing about Girls Who Code is because they're so, the, the equity straight across the board is amazing. Um, and their whole entire visual perspective is um, very hip and trendy, um, but yet at the same time covers every culture that you can possibly imagine. And, um, and I really, I love that because it gives us an opportunity to talk to our kids about something that's completely not coding related, um, but gives us that opportunity to really have that open and honest discussion with our kids. Yeah, we're really so excited for coding and computer science to be this thread that can bring people together, um, even in the most rural communities and big cities, um, and it can be this thing that everyone can access. Um, so I am so happy that so many of you are watching this today um, or watching the recording and thinking about bringing Girls Who Code to your community because we're so excited for them to join that sisterhood and to see the different ways that they can have an impact on the world and on their uh, community. Um, I do just want to share um, just a little bit more information about getting started um, and then we can jump to anything else that might come up, any questions. Um, you can see on this page here, I have my colleague Emily's contact information. Emily is um, a senior manager at Girls Who Code and she specifically supports clubs um, in Idaho. So if you're from Idaho and you have any questions about getting started, you can reach out to her at emily.ong at girlswhocode.com. She is amazing. She really wanted to be here today, but is actually at a conference. Um, but she'll um, be here to support all of you. Um, if you're from Idaho, as you get started, if you're from anywhere else, uh, please reach out to me as your point of contact. Um, again, my name is Valerie and my email is super easy. It's just Valerie at girlswhocode.com. Um, so I'm happy to help point you to your specific um, person who's located in your state um, and happy to walk you through any questions that might come up. Um, wonderful. So any other questions for myself or for Sherry? Um, hopefully that means I was really thorough, but again, definitely feel free to follow up. Um, oh, and I do see uh, there is a question about using it as a summer reading activity. Um, so typically Girls Who Code clubs run during the academic year. So pretty much from August to June. Um, and July is kind of our down month where we update our curriculum and we get resources out. Um, that being said, um, we have seen uh, clubs run in the summer. Uh, the one issue is that there aren't as many resources available. Um, and if you wanna claim your $300, we definitely recommend that you start the club earlier, um, at least get all the application in and claim your funding uh, just so you have it because in July, when we're turning around our curriculum and getting geared up for the new year. Um, our staff capacity is a little bit lower because we're working on a couple other things. Um, so we definitely recommend, you know, first priority during the academic year. Um, if you're thinking about for something for the summer, reach out to Girls Who Code staff and we can kind of help you uh, look into what that can uh, look like in your community and how we can support. Um, 
Let's see, and we have a question. Um, I'm a library employee who's looking to find a facilitator for a club that's starting in January. The problem we're having is that the potential facilitator wants to look at the curriculum. How can I let them see the curriculum without an HQ login? Um, great question. Um, so if they are ready if they definitely want to be the facilitator and they're ready to jump in, they can actually create their own login and they'll use the club's um, ID that you received uh, to log in and then they'll have their own facilitator account. Um, so they can have their own account and facilitator login that's still affiliated with your club. Um, if you aren't sure what your club ID is, uh, you should have received an email from your CSS, your club success specialist. So you can dig back in your email. If you can't find it though, uh, you can reach out to me and I'm happy to help you locate that. Um, can Canadian Library sign up for Girl C Code? Yes, you can. Um, so we're so excited that we are now international. Uh, we have clubs in all 50 states in Canada, India, and the UK. Um, so yes, we have clubs in Canada, um, and we're really happy to help you get started. Um, you'll see, I believe when you start to log in, um, you know, we usually ask for your state and you'll be able to indicate that you're an international club signing up with Canada, um, but you'll receive all the same resources um, and staff support as any other club would. Um, how can we get club shirts? Um, can we use a local vinyl person or do we have to order those? Um, so wonderful um, news on that one. Uh, this year we're actually providing up to 20 free t-shirts um, for participants in Girls Who Code Clubs. Um, so you'll be able to claim those pretty easily just like you would claim the club's fund. Um, there'll be instructions in your login as well. So if you're already a facilitator, you should be able to access that information. Um, if you're interested in getting a little creative, Make your own shirts, you're also welcome to do that. Um, if you have more than 20 girls in your club, um, you're also able to use some of that club's fund to offset any cost of beyond the first 20. Um, but we agree that having those t-shirts really builds community. Our girls are always so proud to have their Girls Who Code t-shirts, so we really wanted to make sure that we'd be able to provide that again this year. Um, let's see, can you tell me how many secondary Girls Who Code clubs are at the West Ida School District? Um, so we do have a feature on our website um, that's essentially find a Girls Who Code club. Uh, the thing is though that not all of our Girls Who Code clubs are on our website because some of our schools opt out um, for privacy reasons um, or individual school policies. Um, so it is possible that there might be a club in your area that you're not seeing. Um, if you have any specific questions, um, I would say reach out to me for now and I can go uh, dig up that information on the back end and provide you with um, any resources about finding a local club. All right, um, it looks like those were all the chat questions. Um, I don't know if there are any other on your end, Tammy. I'm not seeing any, but anybody else um, can take a minute and type in a last question. Um, and I'll definitely emphasize that any questions that don't come in now, I'm still happy to answer. So uh, definitely send me emails if anything else comes up or if you're having kind of any specific thoughts about what Girls Who Code could look like at your library. Because um, we're really happy to help. That's pretty much what my entire job is, is just to help you all start clubs. Uh, so never worry about uh, reaching out too much. <laughs> That's kind of a cool job. <laughs> right? I feel yeah. very happy. I just get to do stuff like this every day. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Sherry posted that um, Girls Who Code social media is also a great resource for ideas. Probably also good to connect with others and that's great. Yeah, we're all over Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and actually when you start your club and if you're ever taking photos or doing any fun activities, definitely tag us. We love seeing and learning about um, individual clubs and what they're working on. Um, it, you know, it's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, looks like there is another question, Valerie. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what are reporting back requirements? Um, would you mind specifying just a little bit more? Are you asking about um, like uh, demographic information and uh, like computer science uh, for the state? I 
or Jen, maybe you're thinking about, okay, good. Um, so we do collect information um, from anyone who creates an HQ account. So you'll see that when you go to log in, it'll ask um, your information um, when you log in. And so we have that information to help us understand how many clubs um, are being started in specific areas. Um, we keep all of that information private because we are very careful with privacy information. We do have a data and research team that reports out on general trends. So uh, like I shared earlier, we have numbers on how many individual um, girls we've reached how many clubs we have year to year. Uh, we have information on the breakdown between third through fifth and sixth through 12th clubs. Um, and then we actually have an entire team um, at Girls Who Code that works on advocacy and policy. And so we're always thinking big picture about computer science and impact um, and what is happening in individual states. And so we often are connecting with educators in individual states to share out um, you know, what we're finding in our clubs. Uh, but that being said, we're also very careful with like privacy, um, especially because all of our participants are minors. Um, we're very, um, you know, cautious with that information. And we want to make sure that any information that we're reporting out is around general trends um, and not individual student information. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, if you need more clarification, definitely keep typing. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, a huge thank you to both Valerie and Sherry for joining us today, um, sharing how the program works. And then Sherry was really, really cool to have you just share what you're doing in your library. I think that's fantastic to have those practical things. And and for those of you um, who've never been to Donnelly, Idaho, um, Sherry's not kidding when she says it is a teeny weeny library. Sherry, what is the fire code capacity at your library? 16. 16. That's 16. Oh, so all of our kids do everything outside too, by the way. Yeah. So we only and, allow three in the building on the computers at a time. Everybody else is outside. <laughs> yeah. And it snowed this past week in Donnelly. So, um, you know, this is somebody who's being incredibly innovative with uh, providing services. It's pretty awesome. So, well, um, again, thanks so much. And um, please, everybody, get in touch with Valerie or Emily and get a club started in, in your community. Wonderful. So, Thank you great. so much. Okay. Emily. Thanks great so much, everybody. It's great to meet you all. Bye bye. Have a great week.